All right, everyone, uh, let's get started. Welcome to 6826. Uh, just for uh, administrative, so we're going to record this lecture and post it online. Um, and uh, you can uh, watch the lecture afterwards uh, if need be. Um, so uh, before we jump into the material, I wanted to uh, welcome you all to this uh, online class. And uh, it's not a particularly large class. It looks like we have you know, 20 some students uh, here in this lecture. Um, so hopefully this can be at least somewhat interactive. So please feel free at any time to jump in if you have questions. Um, I was hoping maybe one way we could start and encourage you guys to participate is I'll pick a couple of names and just ask you to introduce uh, who you are, where you're currently located in the world, where you're joining from, and maybe what your background is uh, in terms of your background in maybe systems and verification uh, for this class. Um, so let me pick out just a couple of names on the participant list here. Um, how about uh, Caleb uh, Noble? Uh, can you say a few words uh, where you're joining from and what your background is? Sure. So I'm Caleb. I am joining from Cambridge. I'm a senior, so I am on campus during quarantine week. <laughs> My background, um, I've taken some classes in systems, uh, distributed systems and 6033 and was interested in getting a deeper dive with this course. Super, thanks very much. Uh, maybe I'll pick on uh, Emily uh, Chen next. Uh, could you say a few words? Hi, I'm Emily Chen. I'm also tuning in from campus um, at Newhouse. And I guess my background is I've taken 6033 and I really just wanted to get like a deeper understanding of computer systems through this class. Super. Uh, thanks very much and welcome. Uh, maybe I'll pick uh, one last uh, person. Uh, Upamanyu, uh, can you say a few words? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm a, a new, new PhD student here at MIT and uh, I have an interest in, in uh, formal verification for systems. Uh, and so I was interested in taking 826 uh, and, and learning more about that kind of stuff. Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, as you all know, this is going to be a 6826, a uh, class uh, that's going to focus on uh, computer systems and verification. Uh, so this is what uh, the, the content is going to be. The official title is Principles of Computer Systems. And the way we sort of interpret it, the way what we're going to talk about is really uh, trying to get at the question, um, what makes a system correct? How do we know a system is going to execute correctly? Uh, so when is uh, some computer system um, uh, system correct? Uh, and uh, this is going to be sort of the underlying question for this whole class. And we're not going to teach you about necessarily new systems techniques. So uh, we expect that you've had some exposure to systems, either through 6033 or other work you've done in the past, or even the higher level classes like 828 or 824 and distributed systems. And instead, we're going to sort of try to abstract away and look at the core ideas that you've seen in computer systems, especially sort of complex systems, and what makes them uh, tick. So the kinds of big ideas we're talking about uh, are things, for example, in concurrency. Locking is a pretty big idea and powerful for uh, dealing with concurrent systems. Uh, right ahead logging in storage systems to deal with crash safety. Uh, various models of consistency in a distributed system, uh, uh, various notions of security like non-interference uh, and uh, such. Uh, so this, this will be sort of table stakes, if you will, uh, for this class. And we're going to take a, sort of a principled view of this, if you will. Um, and I don't mean to say that other people are unprincipled in some sense, of course. Uh, but what we mean by a principled view is that we're going to really try to extract out what are the key properties that these uh, systems or techniques or ideas are going to provide to us. And we're going to go from properties to uh, what we're going to call a specification. So I'll tech talk more about specifications uh, in this lecture and uh, in the rest of the class. Um, but roughly, a specification is going to capture what does it even mean for a system to be correct. And we'll see this is critically important for systems as they get more complicated. And then we'll sort of proceed down this sort of principled view, if you will, and really try to push at even proving 
that a system implementation is correct and somehow meets the specification. So that's the sort of overarching uh, story of what we'd like to accomplish in this class and the kind of you know, angle that we're going to take on computer systems. And um, if you will, the motivation for all this stuff uh, should be familiar. Motivation is really bugs or avoiding bugs. And just to set the context for uh, what we mean by this, um, serious computer systems, large scale, uh, are complicated. And there's many reasons for complexity, as you've probably seen in 6033 or previous classes that you've taken. Um, so for example, uh, concurrency is a huge source of complexity in a computer system. Uh, lots of threads or many computers running at the same time. Uh, the fact that uh, a computer system might be distributed over multiple machines uh, also adds to complexity because now you have multiple machines talking over the network. The network might fail. The computer systems, the computer servers themselves participating in the system might fail, uh, et cetera. Um, security is another huge source of complexity or having to deal with security is a big deal for complexity in a computer system. Um, dealing with faults. So something breaks, hardware or software, how do you make sure the computer system keeps going? Uh, makes your system even more complicated. Um, and then there's sort of you know, ever present also things like performance. Uh, you want your system to keep running fast? Well, you'll probably have to implement optimizations and those add complexity. And uh, evolution. So most successful computer systems have to keep going and keep evolving. And that adds even more layers of complexity. So this is stuff that probably is familiar to you guys if you've looked at computer systems in the past. And uh, probably not a big surprise to you that all of this is going to lead to bugs because it's a complicated piece of software, hardware design, et cetera. And these bugs span sort of the range uh, in terms of the complexity of these bugs or how uh, deep or fundamental they are. And you can imagine there's you know, memory safety bugs. Uh, you, know, you write to a bad pointer, you have a null pointer in your program. Well, these are probably relatively benign at the scale of things we're gonna talk about in this class. Uh, you might have other bugs, like maybe deadlocks in your system. Also, not horrible, but you know, starting to get a little bit more subtle. Uh, then you might have you know, race conditions in your concurrent software. And uh, we start going down the list to more subtle, more sophisticated bugs that really require understanding what is the correctness condition for the system for why this bug might or might not appear. And you might end up at the end sort of with uh, very subtle logic bugs in your system that cause your system to do something bad. And these bugs, like the reason we really want to avoid them, just to close the loop, is that uh, they're going to have some potentially serious impact on your overall system. So you could easily have your system crash, or you might lose data if you corrupt your disk, or you might even uh, leak the data, which is also potentially bad uh, in terms of security. Um, you might also actually have the wrong answer or wrong result in your system, which uh, again, depending on context, could be disastrous. If this is some control system for some large industrial operation, or maybe this is your memory subsystem for shared memory multiprocessors, and you're getting the wrong data from memory, all kinds of examples of stuff that really has to be right. So this is the sort of 10,000 foot view story uh, of uh, what the class is about and why we care about these bugs. And uh, I want to just, just to, for some concreteness, I'll talk about a particular kind of motivation here, which really has to do with this uh, fault tolerance source of complexity. Uh, by the way, if anything is unclear, feel free to interrupt at any moment. And uh, if you don't want to interrupt, feel free to also type in the chat and uh, maybe the TAs can uh, uh, relay your question or answer in the chat uh, as appropriate. Any questions so far? All right. So um, one thing I should say also is this is a bit of an experimental, you know, way of we're lecturing. So if anything seems a little bit fuzzy or unclear, or if you'd like to see us write bigger or more or less or faster, uh, just say, and uh, we'll figure out how to evolve this uh, lecture style as needed. All right. So let's look at a particular example of complexity in computer systems, and uh, this has to do with uh, fault tolerance. 
So fault tolerance means that you're building a computer system and it's important that this thing be reliable and deal with all kinds of exceptional situations or faults that might crop up. There's many kinds of faults you could imagine, right? So you might worry that uh, you might have a power failure. That would be good if your computer system kept uh, doing something sensible after the power failure. So it was, didn't lose data just because of the power failure, for example. Um, there's other examples. Uh, maybe the power didn't go out, but maybe one of your computer components failed. So maybe your disk uh, died and just stopped working all of a sudden. Yeah, that's kind of unfortunate, but uh, there's computer systems that we've designed uh, in the past uh, the, that uh, can deal with these kinds of faults and uh, keep your data even though one disk died. Um, and there's more sort of uh, tricky maybe cases to deal with. For example, uh, maybe your memory is bad uh, and unlike your disk, it doesn't just die, it just flips bits randomly. That would be even more unfortunate or more difficult to deal with. And uh, these examples show up in many contexts and the way we typically deal with them is really through uh, cooking up some kind of a failure model. And uh, the typical stuff you see out there uh, has to do with either sort of thinking of the world as a fail stop, meaning that the computer was running along great and at some point, things failed. So maybe this is the power failure example or your disk dying example, something just abruptly stopped working and you never get bad results of the component that stopped working. It just stops and doesn't lie to your corrupt your state. And uh, sort of the extreme uh, other end of the spectrum are things that people call Byzantine faults. This is for uh, I just sort of accept it as an opaque term, if you will. Uh, uh, this notion of Byzantine faults has to do with uh, modeling the world as doing arbitrarily bad stuff. So it might be that uh, bad memory would fall in this Byzantine case because if you start having your bits flipped in your memory underneath and you don't have hardware support to deal with this like error correcting memory, you might be in uh, sort of an arbitrarily bad situation. Who knows what's gonna happen. And uh, these kinds of faults uh, show up across computer systems. This is what I mean by us looking at these big issues across systems in general. Um, so there are many contexts where you might see these techniques or ideas. So of course, file systems are an easy example to think of. Databases, of course, have these kinds of faults uh, that they deal with in terms of power failures and disks dying. Um, of course, uh, there's distributed versions of these uh, across machines. Um, so if you have a distributed database or a key value store, that runs across multiple computers. Uh, it has to deal with a larger set of such issues. Uh, and even on a smaller scale, uh, we've been talking about sort of maybe one computer here and distributed servers, and even in the embedded case. So your uh, solid state drive that you can buy these days has a little computer, maybe not, not even so little, inside of that solid state drive controlling all the flash chips. And uh, that thing is called the uh, uh, flash translation layer or FTL inside of an SSD. And it also needs to deal with these issues. There's uh, interesting physical effects going on in the flash that cause the flash to wear out. And this FTL controller needs to deal with that issue and present a reliable abstraction to your operating system while papering over uh, and masking the faults that are happening in the underlying chips. Make sense? Any questions so far? All right, and uh, the key challenge in fault tolerance, just to sort of illustrate uh, what's going on, is of course uh, gonna be, um, or one of the key challenges, is dealing with the persistent state. So how do you achieve crash safety for persistent state? Typically something is gonna get lost when your computer crashes and reboots or some disk dies, but something durable should stick around. And the reason this ends up being pretty tricky to get right has to do with the fact that um, your computer could actually start, stop running at any moment. So here we'll sort of illustrate the durable storage, maybe kind of like a disk, but SSD, any kind of a storage device. And on the other hand, you have your CPU running along, running your code, and it issues different writes. So I'm just gonna focus on the writes to the disk. Uh, the reads don't really matter in terms of crash safety. The writes are the things that change the contents of the disk. And the reason that this crash safety uh, is tricky to get right is because you might actually stop running at any point while you're running. 
uh, while the CPU is executing. So it might be the case that ah, we have a crash right here. And this means that this disk write never made it out to disk. So now after a crash, you are trying to write three things, but only two made it out. So this is going to be kind of uh, a problem for us to deal with. Um, so the question is, how do you actually achieve consistency after a crash? So just one example of what these multiple writes might be. Um, in a file system, you could imagine that we have a file represented by an inode. And the file uh, is stored on disk and contains pointers to the disk blocks that store the file's data. And at the same time, on disk somewhere, there's also an allocator. And this guy stores the free blocks so that when a file wants to uh, grow, when the user wants to add more data to a file, we can grab a new block. So it might be initially that there's a free block out here on disk and the allocator points at this block. It's all well and good. How do we use this block for a file? Well, what has to happen at some level is that we need to grab this block out of the allocator. We need to add a pointer from the file to this new block. And then we need to drop this link from the allocator to the block. And these are stored on two different uh, locations on disk. And the disk doesn't provide a way for us to update two locations at the same time. The typical disk interface lets us write single sectors at a time or single disk blocks. And the problem is that there isn't really a good way to order these writes now. So if you write to the file first, then you crash and you haven't actually removed the block from the free list. So now imagine this red, uh, this green X is not there. Well, after a crash, your block is still in the free list and in the file. Now, if someone allocates data to a new file, this block is going to get used again. That's going to be kind of disastrous. The same block is in two different files. And conversely, if you do the writes in an opposite order, well, you might end up with a case where the, you remove the block from the allocator, but it's not in the file yet either. And at that point, you've just lost the block forever. You will never find it again unless you run some kind of an expensive scan procedure after you crash and reboot. So this is the tricky issue that uh, uh, makes crash safety hard is the fact that you can potentially crash at any point uh, during the system's uh, execution. And there are sort of more issues uh, why uh, crash safety tends to be a fairly tricky uh, thing to get right. Um, one additional thing uh, on top of the fact that you can fail at any point is that the disk is actually running concurrently with you. So uh, there's typically a controller inside of the disk. And this controller uh, might actually do interesting things. For example, it might reorder the writes. So typical disks, as we'll see in a second, um, actually take multiple disk writes. And they don't actually write them to durable storage right away. They keep them in a little buffer, some kind of a buffer sitting around in front of the disk. So some kind of a queue of writes over here. And the writes happen to the disk in the background. And there's probably a separate operation that you need to invoke in order to flush these writes. So not only is the situation sort of as bad as indicated by the red axis, but you might actually even have a weird situation where you lose a, the first write shown in this diagram. The second one makes it to disk, but the third one also is lost. And this might happen if the first two writes go into that queue that I have drawn in front of the disk, and they get written to the real durable storage out of order. Now you're in a little bit of a trouble, uh, or it's even a more complicated situation that you have to recover from. So concurrency adds to the complications for fault tolerance. Um, another thing going on in typically storage systems that have to deal with fault tolerance is that the storage device that we're dealing with, such as this disk or even an SSD device or flash chips, they're actually Ah, much slower than the CPU itself. So in order to achieve high performance, it's important to carefully manage the storage device, like the disk or an SSD. And this leads to fairly complicated optimizations that you have to implement uh, in your file system or database uh, in order to extract high performance out of this disk device that you're using. And these complex optimizations have subtle order cases that you have to get right. Uh, or that might demonstrate or lead to uh, bugs. Uh, 
and yet another sort of class to sort of finish the, these examples, um, yet another class of complexity that leads to difficulty in fault tolerance has to do with partial failures. So we'll see this when we look at distributed systems. Um, the problem uh, that I've demonstrated so far is that we have one computer and one disk. So in the worst case, the computer crashes, but the whole thing just stops running. So we had some disk writes, we crashed at some point, and we can recover, and we can try to clean up the world. If you have a distributed system with many computers running at the same time, then you could easily have a situation where some computers uh, keep running, others crash and recover, and you, your system state as a whole might be in a very complicated uh, sort of uh, situation or a state where some computers remember some disk writes, others have lost them, they might now be inconsistent, and dealing with this correctly is uh, a tricky proposition that uh, you have to get right, and uh, it seems like a worthwhile potentially direction for formal verification to make sure that all these corner cases are covered. Sort of maybe a final point I want to make about fault tolerance, and the reason why this stuff is difficult to get right is because this doesn't actually get exercised in the normal course of execution. So as you're running your laptop, for the most part, things are not crashing, and you don't actually test this code that handles crash recovery very often. But there's all kinds of subtle ways in which you could crash, and that code that runs very rarely has to handle all those situations correctly. And that is, that's a tricky uh, place to be in. Hopefully that makes some sense. Any questions so far? All right. So I wanted to sort of say this is not uh, just a sort of a theoretical concern that we're trying to uh, peddle here, if you will. Um, uh, this is a graph actually showing uh, real data. It's a little bit uh, dated now, but uh, this graph is showing the bugs that a group of researchers from uh, University of Wisconsin, if I remember correctly, uh, came up with uh, by studying the file systems in the Linux kernel. That's a very long-term study. They looked at actually uh, bugs or patches in the Linux kernel all the way from January of 2004 to seven years later. So this is a pretty long-term uh, window during which uh, the kernel developers are finding bugs, fixing them, etc. And the line you see on the screen is actually the number of bugs in ext3, which is the uh, sort of base for one of the most widely used file systems these days, uh, ext4, uh, built on ext3. Um, that's a reasonably complicated, but not overwhelmingly you know, horrible piece of uh, code. Or what I mean is that you know, 60,000 lines of code is nothing, no joke, but it's uh, you know, manageable. It's not millions of lines of code. So you might expect this is a highly important piece of code, uh, matters a lot, super widely used, and yet over the seven year period during which the researchers looked at this, there's uh, you know, 200 plus bugs that the kernel developers fixed uh, in this uh, time window. So despite this being a you know, reasonably modest piece of software, 60,000 lines, and being important, that's just really difficult to get right. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, it has to deal with crash safety, concurrency, and other issues we've talked about. And uh, it's not just ext3. You know, maybe you might think, oh, well, we'll eventually plateau out, and you know, we'll reach some asymptote here, and it'll flatten out. But things are actually kind of complicated uh, in a different dimension, which is that new file systems keep coming out. Um, so even if we got ext3 right, ext4, this green line, you know, came along. And uh, you know, initially had a fairly steep curve of bugs, reaching you know over 400 bugs in a shorter period of time, sort of reflecting maybe some of the more aggressive goals that ext4 had, and also the relatively like less time that it's been around. And new file systems keep being introduced. So ButterFS is a pretty widely used also file system these days, but came out January 2009 and also had a similar curve. People kept finding bugs. So this is subtle stuff. Difficult to get right, even for really expert programmers like these guys are that are writing file systems. Make sense? Any questions? I had a question which I just posted to the chat. Um, according to your previous slide, it shows that there's approximately around 200 bugs as of January, to, January 2011. But I'm wondering how bad is 200? Is how comparatively how 
how many bugs are we working with for similar systems or what, how well, do you get a ballpark? That's a good question. Um, bugs so is, one yeah. thing I should say is that you should really think of this as like a relative chart. So it's, it's not like there were zero bugs here or like maybe this 200 is like the end of the world and you're done. Uh, that's really a continuum, right? Like probably what's going on is there were bugs on the left-hand side of this chart. They just didn't look at them because they had to focus their research on something. And these bugs continued yeah. on the right side of this chart as well. So, uh, and these are sort of fixed bugs. Uh, there's probably mm -hmm. many bugs remaining in the file mm -hmm. system as well that haven't been discovered yet. Um, in the grand scheme of things, I think ext3 and ext4 is fantastically reliable. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of a, I don't know, other pieces of software I wouldn't trust my data with nearly as much. And they probably have mm -hmm. uh, more bugs than bugs that get triggered in more situations. That would be sort of my personal guess. Um, I think ext3 and ext4 are extremely well done. And uh, despite this, okay, hey, another way you can, might think of this is that uh, the fact that uh, the, the curve keeps going up is indicative that the developers of this file system are extremely uh, sort of engaged and want to fix all these bugs. Uh, so it's a, but it could I, also I, be that like the data that I'm presenting, uh, you know, not 100% uh, you know, makes my point perhaps, uh, yeah. because uh, maybe these guys aren't fixing all the bugs and maybe yeah. the real number of yeah. bugs that are being reported as 10x and these guys are being lazy and not fixing them of course right. that's not the case to the best of my understanding but the graph itself doesn't say this uh, and um, yeah um, uh, i think the conclusion that i would argue from this graph is that even extremely good pieces of software like okay. ext4 that sort of i take for granted uh, have really subtle issues that keep cropping up yeah, okay, thank you. Sure. Any other comments or questions or other answers from TAs or from Butler? <laughs> All right, uh, so we'll keep going. Um, so uh, maybe to give you a little bit more of a concrete flavor instead of just showing you sort of large numbers on a chart, I wanna give you some, some concrete feel for what are these bugs like and what is going on that's making this stuff uh, so tricky. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, right ahead logging. Uh, so this is a technique that uh, file systems use to ensure, and the database is also used, to ensure crash safety. So the problem that right ahead logging is trying to solve is uh, making sure that after a crash, we don't end up in that funny situation that I was describing a couple of uh, slides back where your allocator has been updated, but the file hasn't been updated yet, or vice versa. So the core problem that right ahead logging is going to solve for us um, is being able to atomically update multiple disk blocks at a time. So the property we would like, if you remember from a few boards back, I'll sort of flip back here, is uh, this situation right here. Uh, so we would like it to be the case that we can update the allocator and remove a block from the allocator and at the same time update the file and put that block into the file and we want to make sure that this all happens at the same time at once and it's not possible that only the allocator gets updated or only the file gets updated they must happen atomically together so this is what right ahead logging does you've probably seen right ahead logging in uh, some systems classes in the past uh, and the technique is actually fairly uh, simple to describe. Um, so what's going to happen is that we're going to take uh, some region of the disk and reserve it for the right ahead logging system itself. We're going to have a header block that we can update atomically. And just to remind you sort of the way a disk typically works is it allows us to update a single block atomically. And logging is going to allow us to update multiple blocks atomically. And the other part of the disk we're going to reserve is going to be for the log itself. And the log is basically going to contain pairs of addresses where we want to write something and the block contents that we'd like to write to that address. And then the rest of the disk is just the data region that we had before. And this log up front is going to help us make atomic changes to this disk. So how does the system with logging work? So um, the way it's going to work is um, you're going to first, if you want to write multiple blocks at once, like the allocator state and the inode pointer, you're going to write all of these guys to the log itself. So that's going to be step one over here. 
You write these guys to a log. You don't touch the data yet, even though that's where we eventually like to put them. And the second step is actually you're going to write something to the header block, basically saying there's a set of two blocks that needs to be written atomically. And you write that into the header. And then you want to actually stick these guys into the data partition. So in step three, what we're going to do is take these blocks out of the write ahead log and put them in their appropriate places in the data region of the disk. And then finally, once we've done that, we can clean up the header blocks. So in step four, we can sort of clear the header and say, okay, well, we're done. We've updated our two blocks atomically. All right, so how does this give us atomicity? Why is this uh, atomic and uh, crash safe now? Well, the way to think of it is to consider, as we were uh, sort of drawing in a, on the diagram a couple of slides back, all the different points at which you might crash. And we need to convince ourselves that indeed, regardless of where we crash, the system will be updated atomically. So let's think about it. So if we crash uh, while we are updating this uh, uh, log region, so in step one, well, if we crash, we come back. Now the question is, what does the computer do when it reboots? We have to actually describe uh, how is the system going to recover from a crash after it uh, crashes and comes back up. So the rules that I haven't sort of said so far, but um, are going to be that on crash, uh, we're going to sort of uh, read out this header block and see, is there an active transaction to be um, uh, committed? So this sort of set of block writes that I'm trying to atomically place on disk is uh, typically going to be called a transaction. So on recovery, illustrated with this light blue color, we're going to read the header and see what's there. If there is a transaction uh, to be committed, then we're going to basically proceed and cause step three to happen. We will read the log contents like we would have normally, like I was describing before, and write them out to the data region. And if there isn't a transaction, when we read the header block over here with a question mark, then we do nothing. All right, so now that you understand the recovery procedure that happens after the computer reboots, well, if we crash during step one, then nothing happens on recovery, and we haven't touched the data region yet, so we are atomic in a, sort of a trivial sense because we haven't touched anything, so, but uh, it's actually a good state because uh, we don't have inconsistent updates being applied. All right, so now let's think of how, what happens if we crash during step two. Now there's something interesting going on. If we crash just before step two, it's just like we crash during step one because the header still contains an empty value indicating no transaction. But if we crash right after the write from step two takes effect on disk, then during recovery, this question mark will see the transaction that's stored in the header block, and it will actually read those multiple disk writes from the log and apply them to the data region. So this is what's called the commit point. At this point, uh, any crash will cause these changes to appear durable uh, on disk because the recovery will force it to be so uh, uh, by reading it from the log and applying it to the data region. And then subsequent crashes during step three uh, are also okay. And it's actually for a fairly subtle reason, which is that even if we crash halfway through applying these writes in step three, mm -hmm. suppose we applied one, but, on the, but not the second write in step three, then when we crash, we're gonna follow exactly the same rules. And as you can sort of see here, we will re-execute step three. But the cool thing is actually, it's okay to run step three multiple times because we'll just write the same data over and over to the same locations. It doesn't matter how many times you run step three. And in fact, what's kind of cool is even if you crash during recovery and you crash again and again and again, you'll just keep applying step three, which is fine to keep doing until the computer stops crashing and you uh, move on with whatever it is that you were trying to do. So this is a, Fairly cool property. And then if you crash at step four, uh, maybe you will discover that uh, the transaction is finally cleared out of the log. But by that point, the transaction is fully stored in the data region. Uh, and we've again achieved atomicity. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, it's a fairly widely used technique in file systems, database systems, etc. And um, despite being 
widely used, um, turns out to be tricky to get right. So uh, the reason it ends up being tricky to get right is, uh, as we talked about before, uh, because of optimizations and performance. So um, here's one optimization that ends up um, causing some uh, difficulties for us here. Um, so optimization one is uh, disk uh, buffering. So, so far we've been uh, thinking of the disk as um, issuing our disk rights to durable storage exactly in the order we sent those rights. So if we perform step one before step two, then of course, if we crash during step two, then the rights from step one are already on disk. It turns out that over time, so this would have been probably in the 90s or something, um, the disk manufacturers uh, discovered that they can actually play a game to speed up computer systems uh, by buffering disk rights uh, in a little controller inside of the disk itself and writing those disks, uh, disk blocks to the actual durable storage like platters or flash chips uh, in whatever order seems to be better for performance. So even though our operating system or file system issued the rights in a certain order, they might actually get written to durable storage in a different order. So I alluded to this earlier in the example. And uh, this, of course, is going to complicate our story here because it's critically important for us that the log area, so step one, happens before step two. And in order to allow the file system to get this right, uh, disks typically introduce a barrier operation that you can issue to the disk. This is in addition to a read or a write operation. And the order in which we have to issue our operations are now, well, of course, we'll do step one. And then between step one and step two, we have to issue this barrier. And the reason is that uh, we need to make sure that if the header from step two really makes it to disk, then it's guaranteed that all the disk writes from step one are also on disk. And the reason it's crucial is because we might now crash and the recovery procedure, the light blue question mark here, might look at the header and look and say, ah, hey, there's a transaction. I should apply this transaction. And then if it goes and reads the contents of the log that should have been there from step one, and it's not there yet, then we're in a bit of trouble because it's going to apply some, some garbage transaction that was left over from way back when on disk. That would be really unfortunate. So it's crucial for this barrier between step one and two to be there. Otherwise, we might be in trouble with respect to crash safety. And then again, turns out that we also need to insert a barrier between step two and step three. So does anyone want to guess why this is the case? So why is it important that we issue a barrier between step two and step three here? What could go wrong if we don't? Go ahead. Uh, I guess. It seems like if you wrote the data, uh, sorry, it's possible, I guess you could write to data before you write the actual header uh, and not write all of the data so you wouldn't get atomicity because if you crash uh, having written some of the data, then you wouldn't finish writing the data and you'd be in some inconsistent state, right? Exactly right, yeah. So just to repeat, uh, what might happen is that you issued some of the disk writes here in step three, but maybe not all of them. You crashed before you got around to this uh, crossed out disk write. But if you didn't have the barrier, it might be that the disk behind your back hasn't even written the disk block from step two yet. So now you're in this unfortunate situation. You crash, this disk write is present, the red crossed out one is missing, and the log header is missing. So nothing is there to finish your transaction for you. So that's really unfortunate. And indeed, it's crucial that uh, the barrier between two and three is there. And very much in the same way, it's also important that the barrier uh, between step three and four must be there. Otherwise, you might be in a situation where you wrote some of the data to the data partition in step three. You clear out the header in step four. If you do that without a barrier, what might happen is that you clear out the header, that makes it to disk, but not all of your disk writes from step three make it to disk. And now you didn't fully apply the transaction in step three, but in step four, you already blew away the header, so nothing is going to recover your transaction after a crash. And, uh, you know, this seems like obvious stuff. I'm just telling you, there's like, there's four steps and you've got to put barriers between all the steps. Sounds simple enough if you sort of look at it the right way, but it turns out the Linux guys got this wrong. 
And this is a, like a real bug that the Linux developers discovered and actually had to fix. This uh, bug was around for a little while in the Linux kernel and like their widely used file system. Uh, so this uh, JBD thing that you're looking at here is actually the journal block device that's sitting underneath of ext3 and ext4 that's providing exactly this kind of write-ahead log that we've talked about. And uh, this is a subtle thing, actually. If you have a complicated piece of software like this JBD and ext3, these guys are talking about, well, you know, if we have something that happened recently, uh, then, uh, you know, it's unlikely that this might happen. And, you know, if you have an appropriately sized journal, it's probably not going to happen. But, ah, there's the point. We need this to guarantee correctness. And they're saying, well, you know, fortunately, the thing doesn't happen all that often, so maybe not so bad. But, like, the core of it was, like, we need this. If you want correctness, this has to happen. And this is, like, a subtle thing to find. And uh, only got found uh, quite a bit after this initial code was written. And the thing they actually, of course, do is indeed uh, issue a flush, which is the Linux terminology for this kind of barrier operation that I was presenting. So I don't mean to complain about ext3 or JBD. These are fantastic pieces of software. Again, what I want to illustrate is that in a complicated system like ext3 and ext4, it's very easy to uh, gloss over some of these corner cases, and they don't manifest until you crash exactly in the middle of, you know, step four when you didn't have a barrier in the disk did exactly this reordering. Could happen and does happen, uh, and it's tricky to get right. All right. Um, so uh, just to convince you that uh, there's sort of even more interesting stuff to worry about here, uh, here's another set of a uh, couple of optimizations that turn out to interact particularly poorly. Uh, so one thing you might have noticed uh, in this uh, example logging system that I've drawn so far is that uh, it's a little bit inefficient. So all the data that you're writing uh, gets actually written to disk twice. You write it once in step one, and then you write it again in step three. So you're basically cutting your disk throughput in half, which is a really steep price to pay for crash safety. Of course, people, you know, people want performance as well as consistency and all these other properties. Um, so people, uh, so file system developers have figured out a clever optimization called log bypass writes. And what the idea is, is that um, for things that require atomicity, like the block allocation example we saw earlier, um, you're going to do the logging very much like we see on the slide here. But if you're writing lots of data to an existing file and you're not uh, requiring atomicity like allocating a new disk block, then it's actually okay for you to issue this disk write directly to the data region right in step one. So basically your transaction is going to contain a set of disk writes that have to be atomic and those are going to go in the log and also a set of disk writes that are going to just like the data region of a file. They don't have to be atomic. And for them, we can bypass the log and write them directly to the data region. And the reason this works out well, or the reason that this ends up being uh, you know, sort of correct, is that um, this barrier over here saves us. So the barrier between step one and step two ensures that if we write the data to some newly allocated blocks, then if the header is present on disk, it must have been the case that all the stuff from step one, both the log writes and the log bypass writes over here on the right, all made it to disk and it's okay to commit the transaction. And if you crash before step two, then this barrier ensures that, um, you know, maybe some writes from step one happened, some of them went to the log, which doesn't matter, some of them went to the data region, but again, it doesn't matter. Maybe those blocks are just free blocks that haven't been allocated yet or are just being allocated in this transaction. So if we just write to them in step one directly, that's okay. They're still unused and they still contain some garbage now. And uh, other situation, maybe these are blocks belonging to an existing file. Also, maybe that's an okay thing for the application to have to do. So ext3 and ext4 both implement the second optimization that I described here. They actually do file data writes uh, directly to the data region, bypassing a log like you see in step one. And here's a final optimization. I, I'll sort of stop with this endless list of optimizations that real file systems implement uh, on this note, which is the third optimization that's particularly uh, clever, uh, is called uh, checksum logging. And 
what checksum logging is trying to get at is the cost of this barrier that we see between steps one and two. The reason this turns out to be a really important barrier is because this barrier has to execute and the application has to wait for this barrier every time they write something to disk and they want to flush that to disk. The reason that the other barriers don't matter as much is because you can actually kind of batch these operations. These guys can be batched and executed, you know, whenever the log basically fills up. So you can keep adding stuff to the log, basically doing steps one, two, one, two, one, two. And only when the log fills up and you're out of space in this log partition, at that point, you will go ahead and execute steps three and four and do these barriers. So these barriers down here are not super critical, but this guy, this barrier between one and two, that's really important. And just to remind you, the reason it's important is that on crash, we want to read the header. And based on the contents of the header, we're going to decide if we want to commit a transaction or not. So if we see a transaction in the header, better be the case that transaction is there in the log blocks, in the log sort of region of the disk. So the barrier ensures this, but that's kind of an expensive thing to do because you've got to issue some disk writes, issue a barrier, wait, then issue the second disk write from step two, wait again, and that uh, sort of adds up in terms of performance. So a clever trick that uh, file system developers figured out for checksum logging is basically to say the header block is going to be some sort of a checksum of the log region. And the reason this is clever and allows us to get rid of this barrier between steps one and two is that if we now crash and the header should contain a checksum of the log blocks, then after crash on recovery, we can read the header and we can read the log blocks. And we can see, hey, do the log blocks match the header? If they match, this means, yep, there's a valid transaction because the checksum matches, must have been written correctly. And if some of the disk blocks uh, from step one are missing, or basically didn't make it to disk by the time we crashed, then that's okay. The checksum is not going to match. But this means that you also uh, don't have to apply this transaction because the file system could not have gone to step three. Basically, the transaction hasn't happened yet. So that's the reasoning for this checksum logging. I saw that, uh, Erwin, I think you had maybe a question or comment. I'm sorry, my mic is on. Oh, no, no worries at all. Yeah. Any other questions or comments about this uh, checksum logging trick? Now that so, I'm here, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Curious about uh, the checksum is not actually something that affects the performance overall, the, the activity. Yeah, so it turns out to be the case. Again, like the interesting thing in computer systems is that you have things that are costly in terms of like many orders of magnitudes from each other. So these checksums, um, you know, the thing that actually gets used in ext3 or ext4, I believe, is uh, CRC32, which is a super cheap checksum to compute. So, you know, microseconds at most of CPU time. And the numbers we're talking about for executing this barrier opcode are probably much more in the almost maybe a millisecond even or multiple milliseconds for a rotational disk. So easily, you know, three orders of magnitude more expensive to do a barrier than to compute the checksum. And even if you compute a cryptographically strong checksum, uh, they'll like maybe like, I don't know, SHA-256 or something like this, you know, you might spend, you know, many microseconds, but probably still faster than a millisecond that you would. Probably not because modern machines have instructions. Indeed, yeah. And uh, that's sort of a, not a good bet to bet against CPU time performance. Indeed, the accelerators are coming in. Uh, modern CPUs have special hardware support for executing hashes quickly. That's, yeah, indeed. Now, one's old intuitions about the cost of things need to be updated. Somebody pointed out to me three or four years ago that uh, it used to be the case that encryption was expensive. But these days, you can encrypt a 64-byte block on an on a modern x86 processor, so four or five times faster than you can fetch it into the cache. Yeah, it's instructive to periodically, as Butler reminds us, to look at sort of the constants that are there and uh, see what's expensive. And uh, these days, like accessing memory <laughs> turns out to be getting costlier, and CPUs are able to do much more stuff with the stuff that's, with the data that's already in your cache. So, Amanda, you had a question? 
Yeah, my, my question was, when does the checksum get computed? Is that the first thing that happens even before step one when it's written to the log? Yeah, so typically what happens with this checksum is you have to compute it basically by the time you do step two right out the header. So uh, often, uh, actually, well, what's maybe easy to do is that as you're writing out these blocks in step one, you could be computing a checksum of them as you're sort of pushing into disk. And by the time you issue the write of the header in step two, you already have the checksum ready to go. And then you put the checksum in the disk write of step two here. Uh, and then um, on recovery, then you just, of course, read the header and then you read all the log blocks and compute the checksum uh, that way as well. Okay. And then the other question that I had is what exact the, the barrier concept here? Is that like a section of memory that's that's being written to with what operations yeah, yeah. So, have taken place? Yeah, good question, yeah. So uh, what's going on with the barrier is that uh, you have your disk here and you have your CPU and there's some kind of a bus here between the CPU and the disk where you send commands. And the standard commands that you would have are something that looks like a read. So you say read address and you get back a block. And you could also issue a write and you say, well, please write, here's an address and here's a block number. And uh, it goes, the disk goes off and writes it. And another command that you can send is this barrier command. Uh, so the CPU sends a barrier command. Uh, some of these barriers are sort of just take no arguments. Some of these barriers might take a particular address that you would like to flush to disk. Um, and then the disk executes the barrier and then eventually returns and says, okay. And okay. Uh, sort of barrier, well, there's many variants of these barriers. We'll look at some of them later in the class. Uh, but uh, the basic idea is that it's, if the disk isn't really going to promise that the write makes something durable and crash safe, then the barrier is sort of really right. <laughs> that's the really right command uh, that says, please write all the stuff that you've buffered up and tell me when you're done. Okay, so essentially you need to wait until the barrier gives you the okay to move on to the next. That's step. right, yeah. So okay. yeah, typically the way the file system implementation looks like is it issues a bunch of these writes, then it issues a single barrier operation, waits for the barrier to complete. That means all the previous writes are done. Then it issues more writes, like the step two here. Okay, makes sense, thanks. Cool, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, all right, so um, the reason I sort of give you these examples is, uh, you know, first, you know, interesting stuff to learn about in general, if you haven't seen these kinds of optimizations before. And other is these are extremely subtle things. So here's a really subtle implication of combining optimizations two and three. If you remember, the argument that I made to you guys for why this optimization number two was safe is because there was this barrier that was enforcing the fact that the bypass writes in step one over here happened before we wrote the log header. Now, this is what sort of turns out to be a sensible explanation. If you look at, again, this particular presentation of write-ahead logging on a single board, this is a sort of, I don't know if the Linux developers really had a clear articulation of this when they're writing the file system. In particular, when they implemented optimization number three, they only thought of this barrier being there to uh, sort of separate the log writes from the header write. And they sort of forgot about this log bypass writes and the reason that the barrier had to be there. So if you combine optimizations two and three, then what could happen is that you could have uh, the log writes and the bypass writes all in step one being issued to the disk. And then without a barrier, because that's optimization number three, you also issue the header write. And now what could happen is that the log writes made it to disk, that's okay. The header writes made it to disk, but these guys got lost, the data writes that were bypassing the log. And now you have a weird situation that uh, in ext4 actually led to on crash, your file containing some garbage data from the previous user of those blocks. So just to sort of quickly summarize that situation, what happened is that if you created a file and you allocated some blocks for the file and you wrote some data to that file, then the data went in step one directly to the data blocks and the allocation and the update of your inode went into the log and committed the transaction in the header. And then on crash, if your log and header got committed but not the bypass data, then you have a new file because that committed, your file has pointers to these new blocks that were allocated but their contents were never initialized because those writes were lost. 
And what's now inside of your file is whatever the previous user had in their file before they deleted it last time. That's a bit of a problem because, you know, first you have garbage in the file and worse yet, it's actually someone's file contents of the previous user of the system that might be sensitive data. That's a pretty serious problem. And the interesting thing is indeed, uh, this was a bug that Linux ext4 had. Uh, they actually introduced this bug in 2008 when they sort of first uh, had these optimizations that could get combined together. And then only six years later in 2014, these guys finally tracked down and realized this is a potential problem. Uh, and actually, one sort of amusing anecdote is that, um, you know, you, you, this seems like a fixable problem if you sort of look at the picture the simple way I've been drawing it. Um, but it's, it was so complicated and intertwined in the Linux implementation that they just said, we'll prohibit the combination of these two options. You could either choose log bypass rights, or you can choose checksum logging but we're not gonna try to untangle this mess and support both these optimizations at the same time. So it's really tricky stuff. Uh, that's sort of maybe the <laughs> conclusion of that example. Uh, so any questions about that? Um, I mean, this is not some deep point that I'm gonna quiz you on like the details of the ext4 right ahead logging implementation, but <laughs> if you guys have questions on sort of the, the uh, thing we're talking about broadly. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe there's not, not a question yet. All right, so, um, so what do we do about these sort of <laughs> tricky bugs? Um, so how do we avoid them? This is what the class is gonna be about. So, so far, I've mostly been giving examples to sort of motivate and put the, some context on this. Um, so how do we avoid bugs? Well, the classical answer, of course, that all you guys have surely been doing is uh, testing. So write some test cases, write a lot of test cases, generate test cases, and uh, see if the system does what it should. Um, it seems like a fantastically good idea. It's actually extremely effective. People find lots of bugs and uh, effective at finding bugs as well. Uh, but the key problem from the perspective of this class is that it's really uh, unable to ensure the absence of bugs. So you can't ensure that there are zero bugs in your system through testing. And depending on the system, it might be that there are some classes of bugs that are just difficult to uncover through explicit testing. Testing is relatively good at finding maybe the easier bugs uh, and automated testing even can find memory errors and some deadlocks perhaps. Uh, and then some of the more subtle issues like what we've been talking about, uh, you know, it's tricky to find this combination of optimizations causing a data loss if you crash at exactly the wrong instant in time and you have a disk that exactly did one thing or another. Uh, tricky stuff to find with testing. So another approach to try to avoid bugs sort of moving towards what we're sort of espousing in this class is this idea of model checking. So model checking, um, kind of a fuzzy term, could mean various things, but generally people use model checking to uh, denote this uh, idea of exploring all possible states. So what I mean by that is that you start out your system and you try to provide all the possible inputs that could accept and see what happens with those inputs. And then the system evolves into a new state, you supply more inputs, and you try to basically cover every possible state that the system could get into, every possible ways that it could execute. And uh, sometimes you do this on symbolic states instead of concrete memory, if you've looked at symbolic uh, bug finding tools in the past. Uh, but the general sort of class of problems that model checking runs into is really what's called, uh, oops, my mouse did something strange. Let me uh, see if I can reconfigure that. All right, um, so state explosion is the general uh, problem that uh, people observe with uh, model checking approaches. There's just too many states to explore. You have a simple system and there's only a couple of inputs. You can easily cover all the possible things that could happen and check that all of them are good. If you've got a complicated system like this ext4 file system, there's just a lot of things that could happen at every possible step. There could be a crash and then there's a crash during recovery. Uh, it's just not a feasible approach to try to explore all of them explicitly. And what we're gonna sort of espouse is uh, an approach uh, which we call verification, which is uh, explicitly proving um, that there are uh, no bugs 
there's a lot of sort of baggage in the statement. Uh, so how do you prove it? What does it mean for there to be a bug? Why are there zero of them, etc.? And we're going to sort of spend uh, quite a bit of uh, time in this class trying to look at this and various things that people call verification. Um, so just to give you a flavor of what verification looks like, um, here's a simplistic diagram, if you will. Um, so a verification typically consists of some kind of a verifier system. So a tool that's going to help you verify that your implementation is good, that you have no bugs. And the typical inputs are, well, you probably have to supply the code that you want to check and make sure that the code is correct. Um, this code also, by the way, is going to be this thing that actually executes. So this code might be the ext4 file system implementation. And you run it over here by just you know, running the Linux kernel and front stores your files, all this good stuff. And the code goes into some kind of a verification system. We'll talk about a couple of examples shortly. In order to verify something about the code, you typically have to supply something that's called a specification or spec for short. And the spec has to describe precisely what is it that you expect the code to do. And finally, uh, you typically need to supply some kind of a proof that basically is an argument for why your implementation, your code here on the right, is actually correct according to the spec that you're supplying. So the view of the world is very explicit that uh, you know, you're supplying all the pieces of uh, the code, the proof, and the spec. Um, but uh, it's nonetheless a pretty powerful approach. And if you sort of do it correctly, you could indeed uh, you know, modulo some trusted components like the verifier itself being correct. Um, you could convince yourself and maybe convince this verifier that indeed your code really does mathematically uh, probably implement this specification. It's a powerful statement and uh, sort of a worthwhile one in many situations. Um, I should say that uh, this is sort of the most general picture. Of course, there's uh, many variations on this diagram. Uh, so it doesn't have to be always the case that uh, there's all these pieces present. Uh, so in uh, various papers that we're going to look at in this class, you'll see situations where there's basically no spec. Uh, so what that basically means is that there's some sort of a, probably a lightweight implied spec. So what I mean by that is that um, you, as a developer of a system, might not have to write down a precise specification that describes what does it mean for your file system to be correct. But maybe the verification system gives you a lightweight spec that everyone should just satisfy. So something like no crashes, or no memory corruption, or <laughs> don't uh, divide by zero. Uh, so sort of motherhood and apple pie kinds of statements that uh, all uh, software should uh, satisfy. And that allows you to do some kind of verification and achieve some sort of a result without having to write down an explicit spec. Other approaches that we'll look at uh, are ones where you might not have to supply a proof. Um, so this means that the verifier somehow you know, automates the proof process. So you give it a piece of code, and maybe you give it a spec and it turns on its own. You don't have to give it a proof. It'll figure it out on its own. Or maybe it won't figure it out, <laughs> but uh, uh, there's at least a chance of being able to prove that uh, your system is correct without having to explicitly supply a proof. Another interesting, actually, situation is that you might not even need uh, executable code. So actually, the paper that we're going to read for next uh, lecture on uh, Thursday is an example of that, where instead of verifying executable code, uh, a group of engineers at Amazon's web services team uh, actually verifies the design. And they actually find they're able to find, uh, to like get quite a bit of value from doing this verification workflow just at the design level or pseudocode maybe at best, but not at the executable code level. And part of the reasons why there's all these variations that I'm describing to you guys is that uh, the full general picture is actually quite expensive to run in practice, as you'll see. Uh, as we go through this class. And uh, maybe the last uh, example I'll mention is that uh, there's maybe a, even a var variation where there is no verifier in the middle. You just have a spec, a piece of code, and maybe a proof all written on paper or written in text files. And even that, we'll look at some examples where that's actually just been valuable in its own right. 
writing down a precise specification and understanding why you think the system is correct turns out to be quite effective at finding surprisingly subtle bugs without even having a box in the middle that gets the computer to check your proof for you. Questions so far? All right. So I should say that uh, this is a recently active area of research. Um, and uh, what we're going to look at in this class is a bunch of cutting edge research papers that uh, look at this problem of specifications and proofs and so on. And uh, at some level, this is a very old area of computer science. So if you look back, even in the 70s, people were talking about proving the correctness mathematically of software. And uh, they had diagrams that probably looked similar to what you see here on the slide. Uh, but there's a number of really fairly recent results that have come out that have uh, really enabled a you know, little explosion, if you will, in uh, activity in the verification of real systems. Um, so one thing that's going on is that the underlying tools have come out and become quite powerful. So things like COC, which is a verification tool that we're going to be using in this class uh, from a bunch of people in France. Um, there's a tool called Lean from Microsoft Research. There's some automated tools uh, like Z3, if you've heard of that, or CBC that are SMT or SAT solvers that have been really powerful over the last decade, become super effective at uh, being able to check specifications and code and uh, um, help us with this verification. Um, there's also a lot of ideas on top of these tools for how to use the tools effectively. So we'll talk about these in our classes. Uh, so uh, ideas like refinement, uh, separation logic, which we'll have a whole lecture about, etc., that have that people have developed that really help uh, this uh, verification workflow be much more effective at uh, applying to real systems. And the last thing that's really driving this stuff is, I think, demand. Um, so I think the two big factors you see: one is security. I think security is a critical motivating factor for this verification. Um, Security is tricky to get right because the bad guy can try lots of different things that you might not have thought of. Verification is extremely effective at getting you to consider all the corner cases by having mathematical proofs of correctness. Um, and uh, the other maybe demand is uh, sort of complexity. Um, you know, we're building fairly complex systems like the paper we'll read for Thursday, the Amazon AWS engineers. They're building really complicated stuff that has to work in all kinds of scenarios. And they're finding that verification is actually effective way for them to get their work done. And uh, the end result of all these sort of, you know, recent, you know, changes in the field is uh, a number of success stories. Um, so we'll read uh, a couple of papers uh, actually early on in this class about verified systems and how well they're working. So the paper I mentioned from Amazon engineers is the reading for this Thursday. There's a verified compiler called comp search that's very widely used that has a proof of correctness that have correctly compiled C code. Might not be a topic that seemed super exciting up front to you guys. Like compilers is often a thing you take for granted, but turns out to be a really subtle thing and compiler bugs turn out to be extremely subtle and hard to spot. Very much like the, the file system crash bug I've been talking about. And uh, maybe a more recent example of a success story is actually the cryptography in the Chrome and Firefox web browsers. Uh, that uh, ships now from Google and from Mozilla's Firefox browser uh, actually uh, are formally verified. And actually the crypto from the Chrome web browser is verified using some research that came out of Adam Chapala's group here at MIT a couple of years ago. This is a very recently active area of research, lots of exciting stuff happening. And uh, hopefully you can get a sense of some of this from uh, this class. Any questions? So far? Yeah. Go ahead, Erwin. Um, the, so the tools that we have right now to work on this are depend on a very specific uh, computer architecture, meaning are, are, are we assuming that this is intended for x86 or, or it's, that doesn't, doesn't matter? So um, it's sort of yes and no. So the details, of course, matter. And if you're verifying things that have to do with assembly, then of course the architecture matters a lot. Uh, many of the tools that I mentioned here are really at uh, sort of a, 
at a level of abstraction above the architecture itself. So uh, they are not really tools that take assembly code and help you find bugs in the assembly code. They're really sort of mathematical reasoning tools almost, or logical reasoning tools. And you can encode a set of rules for what it means for assembly to run or what it means for assembly to be correct. And then you can use these tools to check that your assembly follows these rules. So much of what we're going to talk about here, um, you know, the, the concrete papers we're going to read are on specific languages or architectures or in specific sort of contexts or systems. Uh, but many of the ideas sort of apply broadly to different architectures. Um, and we'll sort of, uh, the, the, the tools that you're going to use, uh, like Coq and uh, separation logic and refinement perhaps, are uh, not really specific to any architecture itself. Very much like, you know, right ahead logging, the example I gave you, seems like a good idea. And it's actually used on every architecture, on file systems and databases. It's just a good idea across the board. Um, now, I should say that uh, you're right that if this verification needs to like, get deployed in the real world, these tools need to exist for widely used languages and architectures and so on. And I think uh, these tools are, just to be honest, I think are not there yet. I think this is a active area of research and there's a lot of progress being made, but you know, a typical application that you'll find in, I don't know, Apple's you know, iPhone app store probably isn't the thing to verify yet, just because the tools aren't there, the understanding of what, how to specify the stuff isn't there, the effort is too much for the payoff for some random iPhone app probably isn't there, um, but uh, it's coming up. So this is a, you know, you'll get a better sense probably of what the trade-offs are in this class. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, so if there's no other questions, I wanted to do sort of two things. One is, uh, I suppose I should say what the logistics are for this class. Um, and uh, that's probably just a quick note. Um, so in terms of logistics, um, as I've mentioned so far, um, there's a lot of papers we'll be reading, cutting edge results in this space. Um, so there's a paper to us assigned for tomorrow. And for basically every lecture, there's some reading that you can find on the class website that you should read and prepare. And uh, the other part of the class is really lab assignments. Uh, so these guys are going to get you familiar hands-on with what it means to formally verify something. Um, and uh, we've posted some homework assignments. Uh, these labs are going to be in the COC proof assistant. Uh, and uh, you'll learn um, some basics of how to use this tool um, through a couple of homework assignments over the next couple of days. Uh, also, the details are on the schedule page. And then from that point on, we'll actually post lab assignments where you'll work with fault tolerant storage systems, uh, simple examples of them, but still, um, to understand what it means to formally verify and specify them. Uh, we encourage collaboration in terms of discussions. So if you want, please feel free to post on Piazza to find other students that can chat with you about lab assignments in your time zone or whatever works for you. So it's great if you can sort of form a group to do uh, lab assignments and to discuss them, but please uh, submit sort of individual solutions for labs. So everyone should really type up their own symbols, you know, <laughs> on the keyboard and submit that as your answer. And in terms of grades, uh, we're gonna uh, basically grade your labs. We're gonna grade um, what we call paper summaries. Um, so in the class, we're not going to have a midterm or a final exam, partly because it's just cumbersome to do this all online. So instead, what we're doing is asking you guys to pick five papers throughout the semester. So we've grouped the topics that this class covers into five broad classes. And on the schedule page, you'll find a link to these groups. And for each group, you should pick a paper in that group and uh, this group sort of write a summary. What is, what is the paper about and what is, how does it fit in the grand scheme of this class and the other papers you've read? Um, the details are on the website. Um, and the last thing is uh, class participation. So uh, please, like, it would be great if you guys can join the live lecture um, and concretely we'll uh, grade your quest. We ask you to submit a question and answer for every paper that you read. Uh, again, the details are on the site when you click on particular papers for each uh, lecture. And the staff for this class uh, are uh, Butler Lampson, who you've heard from already. Um, he actually taught this class for many years before many of the tools that we're going to be using came around. So he developed quite a lot of this uh, material uh, on pen and paper, if you will. Um, and now we have the tools to be able to really uh, do this much more in the style of programming instead of just writing uh, proofs on paper. And uh, myself, we are the two co-instructors uh, for the class. And we have two TAs, uh, Tage and Stella, 
and you'll see them in office hours and I'm sure they will help you get up to speed and help you debug the uh, lab assignments and homeworks that we will assign to you guys. So that's the logistics. Um, I want to sort of uh, end uh, in the last five minutes by giving you a little bit of a demo of uh, what it, uh, like an extremely simple demo of what it means to do some simple formal verification. Um, so here um, on my computer, uh, you can see the development environment for this tool called Talk that we are going to be asking you to use. And I'm implementing a simple bank. So for here, I will uh, have the statement record bank equals two balances, X and Y. These are two accounts, they're natural numbers. And uh, this uh, Cox system is kind of like a programming language. So we've defined a bank, which is kind of like a struct in C or Go that you might be familiar with. And we can write functions. So this is a functional programming language. So there's no side effects. So if you want to implement a transfer between two accounts, like transfer from X to Y, then instead of modifying the bank in place, we can write a function that returns the new bank, the new state of the bank after this transfer has happened. So here, in order to transfer some amount from X to Y, we're going to build a new bank where X has the amount it had before minus the amount being transferred, and Y has their previous balance plus the amount being transferred. And in Coq, you can actually take the code that we've written up here, and you can actually uh, execute it uh, by extracting it to Haskell, which is a functional programming language you can really run. So here I can say extraction transfer, and uh, over on the right, you see actually what this code looks like in the Haskell programming language, and this stuff you can actually run. And I can actually run this separate extraction command, and that just asks Cock to write this stuff to a file. And now that I have this stuff in a file, I can switch to a terminal and actually actually show you guys. So here's uh, bank.hs. This is the Haskell code corresponding to the bank that we just implemented. And we can actually run this. We can compile a driver, so this main source code that I'm compiling. It's just a little program here that you can see. It uh, just reads a number to transfer, and then it transfers it and prints the bank before and after. So we start out with a bank where everyone has $10. We read some number, then we transfer that much from X to Y, and then we print the bank again. And we can actually run this thing. So here's 10.10. I can transfer five bucks. Now we have one guy with five, another with 15. Seems great. Would be great if I could prove that this is always correct. So here's a weird case. What if I transfer $20? So more than I have. Well, here's a strange situation we end up in, which is that we start out with 1010. I transfer $20. One guy is left with zero. The other guy has 30. So money appeared out of thin air. The bug, of course, isn't super exciting here. What's going on is that the arithmetic being implemented here actually saturates at zero. So instead of getting minus 10, you sort of just run into zero and stop there. So 10 minus 20 equals zero in this system. Uh, it's kind of weird, uh, but nonetheless, in Coq, we can actually prove a theorem uh, about the correctness of this transfer function. So we're gonna change our transfer function to actually check if the source account has that much money. So this less LT deck is a less than, that's the way to read it, if the amount is less than, than the guy has, then we can actually transfer it. Otherwise, we'll just keep the bank as is. We're not going to transfer. And in order for us to specify the spec for what this thing is supposed to do, we're actually going to write a helper function that takes a bank and gives us the total amount of their money there. So the total is X's balance and Y's balance. And we can prove a theorem called transfer safe. This almost looks like a mathematical statement. So for all banks, B, so regardless of what the bank is, and regardless of what the amount is you want to transfer, the total money in the bank B is the same as the total amount in the bank after you've transferred that amount from X to Y. So a really cool theorem statement. That's actually much more powerful than any test case you might run. So any corner case should be automatically discovered by this because it's for all amounts. And the way this proof goes is we basically consider what's in this bank so you'll learn much more about these commands that I'm typing out here, but uh, we're going to take this bank B and the struct is going to take it apart from its constituent states. So there's going to be B's uh, X balance and Y balance. And now the thing we have to prove is that the total of this bank that has balance X zero and balance Y zero is the total after we do a transfer. 
And after some sort of mechanical simplifications, we're left with, you know, the total of this is the total of implementing the transfer function. And the destruct command is going to basically consider the two cases. Either the guy had that much money or he didn't. And now we have two cases to consider. In the case when the guy had that much money, we're going to sort of simplify this away. And what we're having to prove is x0 plus y0 is x0 minus the amount plus y0 plus the amount. And by the way, we know that the amount is less than what x0 had. So that's OK. And there's a command called Leah that you'll learn as well that proves these kinds of mathematical statements, arithmetic. So now we have a proof. Yep, the bank is, in this case, good. And in the other case, uh, we know that the amount was not less than. But here, the transfer function did nothing. There's basically very, very much nothing to prove here. Leah also proves. So with this QED, we've actually mathematically proven that, indeed, this bank uh, will not lose money after any transfer operation, which is a pretty cool property. Now, this is a very weak statement, and this is a very toy piece of code that we've looked at here. Uh, but uh, it sort of maybe helps you get a little bit of a feel. You'll start getting it through homework assignments as well for what it means to do this kind of formal verification. And in the lab assignments, you'll build up through a series of exercises to fairly interesting uh, replicated disk system that you can actually run on Linux and run the ext fire file system on top of a replicated disk storage system that you are developing. And uh, that's going to deal with disk failures and keep data alive, even if one disk fails. Uh, now, again, it has some limitations, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, the, the labs will increasingly uh, guide you through removing some of the sort of toyness of the system we're looking at on this particular screen here. So that's it for uh, this intro lecture. Uh, you guys have any questions that I can uh, help you guys with or answer so far? I should also say that uh, we're sort of basically at the end of time here. Sorry for running over by a minute or two. Uh, if you have to run, uh, that's all right. Uh, I see you guys on Thursday. Please look at the schedule page and read the paper uh, by Amazon engineers on how they do formal verification before um, Thursday's lecture. Uh, and uh, Bill Wu has raised his hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't, don't mean to make fun, but uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to ask, is there any like real kind of uh, real world systems that use COC to, uh, for verification? So actually the crypto code in Google's Chrome is verified in COC. They actually run COC behind the scenes to generate the elliptic curve assembly code that then uh, ships with the Chrome browser and the COC proof uh, both uh, proves that their implementation of uh, ED2509 arithmetic is correct and for other curves and generates the executable code that the proof is talking about. Hmm. Okay. And similarly, Comcert is actually written in the style that Nikolai just wrote this bank. And then uh, the, this is the verified C compiler. So there's a proof about Comcert as a functional program implemented in COC, and then it's extracted and run. So, so maybe just to summarize, uh, like, so one view on this stuff, uh, like, th these things are pretty powerful and there are real examples, like the two examples we've given you so far. And there's a couple of others of serious stuff being done with the tools we have, like Coq and Lean even, uh, and Z3. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think this is still early stages for verification and wouldn't be surprising at all if we discover like in five years time or 10 years time that the tools we use are completely different. and. Uh, you know, the tools we have now, COC, are very powerful for exploring this space. But other tools that you'll actually see in some papers, like Daphne, are much more geared towards a narrower set of problems, but they're much better at that particular niche of problems. Um, so there's a trade-off. I think COC is a really good exploratory tool, and in some ways it's actually powerful enough to also do useful stuff, absolutely. Uh, but then other tools are perhaps more usable or more focused or more automated for specific domains. All right, any other questions? All right, so if there's no more questions, uh, thanks very much for uh, joining us. Uh, we'll see you guys on Thursday in the Zoom link and uh, Butler is gonna give a lecture about this Amazon paper that uh, you guys should read ahead of time. Uh, please come with questions. Thanks, uh, see you guys then. Thank you.
thanks.